When I was a sophomore in high school, my best friend Dave and I decided to declare war on our school library. Uh, more accurately, we declared war on Miss Cipher, the school librarian. Now, Priscilla Cipher was a tiny little lady, maybe four and a half feet tall. Um, can you put that image up there for me? Does she look like a librarian or what? That's, that's Miss Cipher. Uh, little tiny lady, but she ruled the library with an iron fist. I mean, she rooted out talkers and socializers with relentless enthusiasm. And since my friend and I were usually goofing off in the library, we were often sort of on the business end of her shushing, and, and we were in trouble with her all the time. So naturally, we eventually felt like we had to rebel against Miss Cipher's authority. One day we noticed that every single shelf in our school library was held in place by four metal clips, one on each corner. And then we discovered if we removed just two, the opposite corner clips, it would destabilize the shelf so that the next person that came to take a book off that shelf, the entire shelf would tip and all the books would fall on the floor. So we secretly spent several weeks unclipping dozens and dozens of these little metal clips. And then we just sat back and waited for the inevitable crash of books falling to the floor. And we thought it was just hilarious. Now, of course, it was wildly immature, completely irresponsible, um, and I feel bad about it to this day. But we were sophomore boys, so, you know, there's that. Now, I don't think Miss Cipher needed to be Sherlock Holmes to figure out uh, who the culprits were to this uh, falling shelf phenomenon. So within a few days... We were hauled before the swift and severe justice of Priscilla Cipher. She confronted us with the evidence, had a whole pile of, our, of these little clips, and then she proceeded to expel us. She excommunicated us from the school library for the rest of the school year. But first, she sentenced us to our punishment. And that was replacing every single last clip on every single shelf. And then she kept their eye on us for the rest of our high school careers. But the funny thing is, by the time I graduated, Miss Cipher and I were like best friends. She became one of my favorite school teachers. Well, we're in the second week of a series now that we're calling The Politics of Jesus. Now, we all know that the word politics, uh, the very word itself sets our teeth on edge. It feels like our entire nation has been on edge for months now, for all kinds of reasons. So, Today I want to ask you, as we begin, to consciously set aside, you know, all that stuff. Set aside the campaign, set aside the debates, the contentious election, uh, the social media rancor. Set aside all of it so that now, for these next few minutes, we can open God's Word together. If you watched it last week, uh, you saw that Pastor Jeff began with a sermon called Jesus and Government. And we looked at what Paul had to say in Romans chapter 13 including these verses. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. And Jeff told us that human governments, according to the Bible, are, are ordained by God. That is, human governments have authority derived from God himself. And therefore, God has established human governments for two main purposes, to restrain evil and to promote good. If we go back to Miss Cipher for just a minute, uh, her role was to promote good, that is to keep order, to maintain the library as a place of study and learning, to make sure all the books were in the right places on the shelves. Now her role also was to restrain evil, which unfortunately was Dave and me during those days. And she wielded her authority to do just that and give us the punishment we so richly deserve. Now, we all know today that, that governments do not always carry out these responsibilities in the righteous way that God would so desire. But in general, we are called in Scripture to honor God by living under the laws and the authority of human government. And that leads us to the question of citizenship. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, citizenship is simply how we live together in a certain community. Our citizenship is defined by the requirements of a government and then also by the rights and privileges provided by that government. Now, we're going to look at a very familiar story in the New Testament today, one I'm sure you've heard of and know, know a lot about. But let me give you just a little background as we begin. The story we look at today comes from the very end of Jesus' 
public ministry. Uh, He's just weeks away from the cross, his death and resurrection. He has, uh, during his ministry, announced the arrival of the kingdom of God. He's identified himself as the Son of God. He's healed the sick. He's fed the hungry. He's raised the dead. And he's been teaching about the difference between empty religious ritual and a righteousness that comes from the heart, a true righteousness. In the previous chapter, chapter 21, he made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem as he rode a donkey into town. He has thrown the money changers out of the temple from their corrupt practices. He's been teaching growing, growing crowds of people in parables, parables that often confronted the hypocrisy of the religious leaders of the time. And so Jesus by this time, has enemies in very powerful positions. And now those enemies conspire against him. I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 15. Matthew writes, Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Now let me pause here just for a minute because we don't uh, automatically see the great irony That this story begins with. The Pharisees and the Herodians were cultural, religious, and political enemies of that time. The Pharisees, which I'm sure you've heard of, uh, were religiously and socially conservative. Uh, They believed in the strict observation of the law of Moses, uh, what we call the, the first five books of our Old Testament. The Herodians, on the other hand, were more politically motivated. Uh, They aligned themselves with the Roman authorities because that was the very best way for them to survive, uh, especially economically. So they were loyal to the rule of King Herod, who was the Jewish uh, puppet king empowered by Rome to rule that region, thence their name, the Herodians. So under normal circumstances, these two groups had very little in common and, in fact, were enemies. But when it came to Jesus, they are on the same side. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Let me pause here again and explain the imperial tax. Now this was the most hated tax of all, Uh, in ancient Israel. The tax had to be paid with a silver coin called a denarius. Now, this is not a denarius. It's just a silver dollar, but it gives you an idea. On one side of the denarius was an image of Tiberius, the Roman emperor at the time, with an inscription that read, Tiberius Caesar, worshipful son of the god Augustus. So a claim to being divine. On the reverse side was an image of the Roman goddess of peace, who was called Pax, and the abbreviation for Pontifex Maximus, which means high priest. Now, naturally, the Jews found this coin to be incredibly offensive because it bore an image of a pagan emperor, and to them it was a direct violation of the second commandment of the Ten Commandments, where God commanded them not to worship any images. It also reminded them of the Roman occupation of their land, and uh, the, the denarius coin was not only issued by the, by the emperor, Tiberius, it also literally was his property. Uh, we don't think of money like this in our culture, but then uh, the coin was actually minted from silver that belonged to the emperor. It bore the imperial seal of the emperor, it represented his power and authority, his deification, and his sovereignty over all the peoples that were forced to use it to pay this particular tax. Now, here's the trap that these two groups try to set for Jesus. If Jesus says it's lawful to pay this tax, he would be seen as supporting Roman rule and would lose all credibility and alienate the people who had just recently hailed him as their king. But if Jesus says to pay the tax is illegitimate, and denies it, then he risks becoming branded as a political revolutionary and is in trouble with Rome. Either way he goes, he's got a good chance of being killed. That's the trap. Verse 18, but Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. So they brought him a denarius, and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied, Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God 
what is God's. Or you may recognize the ESV translation, therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Verse 22, when they heard this, they were amazed, so they left him and went away. Now this is obviously a very extraordinary story in so many ways. It's a highly political story. Uh, They were trying to force him to pick sides. Many of us have felt that in recent months. It's a deeply spiritual story, and that's the reason I also call this a revolutionary story. So what's Jesus teaching here? Well, we just can start off by saying that Jesus is teaching us as his followers that we live simultaneously in two kingdoms. We have a kind of dual citizenship. First, we live in what I would call the kingdom of Caesar, the kingdom of Caesar. Well, I graduated from high school in uh, June of 1974, and so that August I turned 18 years old. And that meant at that time in our nation I was under a legal obligation to register for the military draft. I know a lot of you guys out there uh, can remember uh, when the draft was in force. You might remember uh, having to do that or getting letters about that. And by the way, let me just uh, give a word of uh, honor and thanks to all you veterans out there on the week of Veterans Day. But it was at the tail end of the Vietnam War, and the draft was still in place at that time. But with all the things going on in our lives as a family, me getting ready to go off to college, we just never got around to doing it. I never got around to registering. So about two months into my college fall, my parents forwarded a letter that I had received from the United States State Department. I got the letter out of my mailbox and thought, oh, wow, cool. I opened it up and realized, ooh, ooh, not so cool. The letter said I had failed to register for the draft, and I had 30 days to reply in writing, explaining my failure, or else I was subject to arrest. Whoa. I realized that I accidentally had become a draft dodger. So I called my dad. He helped me put together a letter explaining my oversight, and I just hoped to avoid going to jail by the end of my freshman year. And in the time it took that letter to make it to the State Department, uh, the draft was, uh, the registration ended, and nothing ever came with that, and I was grateful. But that story illustrates the role and the authority of the kingdom of Caesar. Last week we saw Paul taught that all human governments have authority derived from God, authority to restrain evil and to promote the common good, which in the case of Rome meant taxation. Roman taxes produced Roman roads, crisscrossing the entire empire, many of which are still visible today if you visit that part of the world, and allowed for the freer movement of people and ideas, more so than ever before in human history. One historian has called it the internet of the ancient world. Uh, Roman taxes also produced the Roman military, which was not only brutally efficient, but kept the peace. And paradoxically, the combination of those roads and that peace allowed for the spread of the gospel over the entire Roman world. And the same is true of our government today. We live under a much different form of government, of course, but one still charged with restraining evil and promoting the common good, which also means taxes. Taxes build roads, create infrastructure, provide us as citizens with electricity and gas and clean running water. They provide schools and rules for proper library behavior, and they establish laws for the common good, like the speed limit, of which I've been reminded several times in my life, Or more recently, statewide orders to wear masks or to stay at home for a time. So when Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, he's saying a couple of things to us. First, he's recognizing the God-given role of human government even under a pagan dictatorship. The emperor Tiberius of Rome. And when Jesus uh, asks whose image is on the coin, he's acknowledging that the denarius actually belongs to Caesar. Uh, That is, it's the God-given authority of Caesar or the government to require what belongs to Caesar. Secondly, Jesus seems to be assuming that his followers will obey civil authority. Paul tells us in Titus chapter 3, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always be gentle toward everyone. As followers of Jesus, we are called, instructed, to be good citizens of this earthly kingdom. Thirdly, Jesus is also acknowledging that there's a whole nother 
kingdom. That we are also citizens of the kingdom of God. So there's the kingdom of Caesar, and then secondly, there's the kingdom of God. I've told this story before, but two months after my wife and I were married in 1985, uh, we went to uh, Bolivia, South America as short-term missionaries for six months. We lived in Santa Cruz, uh, where we uh, each taught English as a second language in a Christian university there. It was just an amazing experience for us together, our first uh, few months of married life, a cultural adventure that we never really forgot, made friends. But when the time came to go home, after six months living as foreigners in a foreign culture, we were pretty ready to get home. So we did everything we had to do, which meant we had to get our airline tickets validated. We had to get our passport stamped with the right visas and so forth. And when everything was, was finished, we went to the airport. Everything was smooth until we got to the to gate and the last stairway before boarding our flight. Uh, at the top of that stairway, right at the gate, there was one more official-looking guy with a hat and a badge standing there. And as I got to him, he um, asked to see my passport. So I gave him my passport, and he opened it up. Flipped to the page where there was a a travel visa uh, stamped on it and signed. And he pointed at it and he said to me in Spanish, "Um, this this visa is not valid. And then in my pigeon Spanish back, I said, what do you you mean it's not valid? We just got it this week. And he pointed at it again. He said, this man, the signature, he said, this man doesn't work there anymore. And then I realized what was going on. This was one more sort of low-level official who recognized us as North Americans and was hoping he could sort of bluff his way into getting a little tip um, uh, for his services. Uh, Now, we had already paid two or three or four different officials to get all those stamps, and I just just had had enough I wasn't doing anymore. So I grabbed my passport back, and I flipped to the front page, and I pointed to where it says United States of America. And I said, see, see this? USA, Estados Unidos, I am citizen of this country. Ronald Reagan, el presidente, mi amigo, I said. And he wasn't really my friend, but I said it for, my, for emphasis purposes. And the guy looked at me, kind of surprised for a minute, and then he got a little smile on his face, and he handed my, my passport, and he said, pase, and he let us go. So physically, I was in one country, but I had citizenship in another country. As followers of Jesus, we are citizens of the kingdom of Caesar, but also citizens of another kingdom altogether. A kingdom ruled by God, a kingdom governed by God's laws, a kingdom designed to reflect the righteousness of God himself. And Jesus spent a great deal of his ministry teaching about the kingdom of God. It's a kingdom marked by a true righteousness of the heart, not just by religious ritual. It's a kingdom marked by love of God and love of neighbor, a kingdom marked by humility and generosity, hope and joy. And two things we need to understand about the kingdom of God. First is that the kingdom of God is already here. It's already present. The kingdom arrived in the person of Jesus who announced at the beginning of his ministry that the kingdom of God is at hand, repent. And he's referring to himself. That in him, the kingdom of God had arrived. The kingdom of God is also here now in the community called the church. So when we as followers of Jesus, when we as the church live bearing witness to the gospel, the kingdom of God is present now. But secondly, we need to know that the kingdom of God is not yet fully realized. Not yet. We look at the book of Revelation in chapter 7 and read, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now, this is the Apostle John's vision into the eternal kingdom of God, a new community of people from every nation, tribe, people, and language that will be fully realized in the new heaven and new earth, the culmination of God's promised redemption and salvation. So, even as we sit here today, wherever you are as you're watching this, if you're a follower of Christ, you hold two passports. First, you're a citizen 
of, in this case, the United States of America, but you're also a citizen of the eternal kingdom of God. And then the third thing we see in this story is what Jesus has to say about when those two kingdoms collide. So thirdly today is when kingdoms collide. Uh, my first political memory, um, and it's vague, was of the, is of the 1964 presidential election. I know that's going way back, but anybody out there know who the two candidates were, Republican and Democrat, in 1964? I'll wait. Right, Lyndon Johnson and Barry Goldwater. Turned out to be one of the most lopsided elections in the United States history. LBJ won 44 out of 50 states and a whopping 486 electoral college votes. But what I remember as a second or third grader is the debate going on on the playground during recess. And this is what I remember. Somehow the rumor got started amongst third graders that if this guy Goldwater got elected president, he was going to make us kids go to school on Saturday. Again, no idea how it started, but that's what we talked about at recess. And we were outraged. I mean, we were outraged before outrage was a thing. Uh, what kind of man wants kids to go to school on Saturday? I mean, we knew little of the civil rights movement. We knew little about the Vietnam War. We knew little about the economic situation. We knew little about political parties, but we did know we did not want us to go to school on Saturdays. Now, if you're familiar at all with the history of this church, the Chapel Street Church, formerly First Baptist Church of Geneva, before that, First Swedish Baptist Church of Geneva, you know that this church was founded in the late 1800s by Swedish immigrants to this country. And they came here seeking religious freedom. They came here to escape the state's control over how they practiced and, and preached the faith that they saw in the Bible. And when they rebelled, they paid a price. They left their homeland. They left their jobs. Many left their families, and they came to this new land so that they could give God what was due to God. But when we read sometimes uh, th this phrase, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's, I think we very often get stuck on the first half of that sentence. We want to say, well, what do, what do you mean give back to Caesar? Caesar is Caesar. Caesar's corrupt. Caesar's cruel. Caesar's pagan. Caesar doesn't do things that I like. We want to talk about taxes. We want to talk about uh, school on Saturday. And we tend to miss the second half of the sentence, which is the whole point of the story. Jesus said, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Now what belongs to Caesar in the story? The imperial tax, a coin minted out of Caesar's silver. And what belongs to God? Everything. Any Jewish person listening to Jesus teach here would have recalled immediately Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. So Jesus is saying the denarius belonged to Tiberius because his image is stamped on it. It's just a coin. It's just money. But human beings are stamped with the image of God. And so what do we give back to God? What do we render? What do we owe to God? Everything. Our whole selves. Our worship which is our extravagant devotion, nothing above the Lord our God. Our hearts, our ultimate allegiance and obedience, we, we give him our hope. We'll talk more about hope next week. And the flip side of that is we must refuse to give Caesar what does not belong to Caesar. We must refuse, for example, to give Caesar our worship. You know, the earliest believers in the Roman Empire, that first century, refused to bow their knee, refused to give their ultimate allegiance to Caesar, and many of them paid horrific consequences for that. But they would not bow down. We must refuse to give Caesar our hearts. In that first century, when Roman law allowed for what was called the exposure 
of newborn infants. That is, when a Roman family didn't want a certain a child, either by sex or some deformity, it, it was legal to just expose them, to leave them in the woods, to leave them, and they would die. But the Christians believed that even newborns and even the unborn bore the image of their creator. And because they bore the image of God, they were valuable, and the Christians would find those babies, and they would adopt them and raise them as their own. We must refuse to give Caesar our hope. Again, we'll talk more about hope next week. But in the early two, first two centuries of the Christian church, there were two great pandemics, plagues, that swept across the Roman Empire. And during that time, uh, many of the pagans left the cities because they were terrified of this disease that they didn't understand. But the Christians stayed. The Christians stayed and ministered to the sick. And many of the Christians died. And they were willing to do that because they had a hope greater than this life. They had given their hope to the God who had saved them. So what happens then when these two kingdoms collide? What happens when our citizenship in this earthly kingdom is incompatible with our citizenship in God's eternal kingdom? What then? Well, last week Jeff put it this way. He said, we obey government to the point where obedience to government would be disobedience to God. We obey government to the point where where obedience to government would be disobedience to God. What then? When do we disobey civil authority? Do we disobey when we are ordered uh, to wear masks, for example, for the common good? Well, no. What if we are ordered to stop proclaiming the name of Jesus? Do we rebel then? Yes, we do. Or what if we're unhappy with the ticket we got for going 45 into 35? No. What if we're told, ordered, to stop caring for the poor? Yes. So how do we disobey? And this is important. We disobey not by fighting Caesar. We disobey by loving God. It's an important distinction. Think about it this way. Jesus lived at a time when the emperor Tiberius thought of himself as a god. Yet Jesus never called for the overthrow of Rome. Never. The apostle Paul wrote much of our New Testament while he was imprisoned in Roman prisons, in Roman chains, yet he never called for the overthrow of Nero, who was the emperor during his lifetime. And yet this tiny, suffering, persecuted group of people, the early church, that should never have survived the first century, not only survived, but thrived by living out the truth of the gospel, by loving God, by loving their neighbors, by loving even their enemies, by valuing every human being as being created in the image of God, by by welcoming people from every race, culture, and economic status into their new community, by refusing to give their ultimate allegiance to Caesar, and by being willing to suffer the consequences of their commitments, they eventually change the world. Change the world. The Roman Empire is no more. The church thrives and grows day by day. A number of years ago, I had a chance to travel to Russia when we had a sister church at that time in a city called Samara, a Transfiguration Baptist Church. And while I was there, uh, the pastor told me many stories because I was curious and interested of uh, how um, he and his congregation had suffered different kinds of persecution at the hands of uh, the local and national government. But he told me that the most painful thing that the government ever did uh, to impact his church congregation was passing a local law that made it illegal to give resources to the church. Uh, They were trying to choke out the church economically. So they made it illegal to give. I want you to think about that for a minute. Would we regard that here in our culture as the most painful thing that could happen to us? Would we be relieved? How would it strike us? He said their people in that church decided that even though they knew the punishment would likely be harsh, he knew the gov- they knew the government had the power to keep them from ever seeing their families again. If they violated that law, most of them chose to continue to give to the church. And some were willing to go to prison 
because they did. Now we are citizens, Jesus says, of two kingdoms. But one of those kingdoms is earthly and temporary. It's important, but it's earthly and temporary. The other kingdom is heavenly and eternal. And one of those kingdoms is far greater than the other. One of those kingdoms has far more power than the other. One of those kingdoms has far more authority than the other. And here's what Jesus is saying. That when and if those two kingdoms come into conflict, we have only one king that we serve. We have only one king who deserves our worship. Only one king who gets our hearts. Only one king who gets our hope. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord God, today we thank you for your word. And the relationship of government, citizenship, and faith is difficult and confusing for us, especially now. But it's so important for us to look into your word to receive guidance and understanding. Remind us today that we do indeed have citizenship in both kingdoms, in this earthly kingdom, and help us to be good citizens, to engage where we should engage, to expect the best of our leaders, to vote our conscience, all those things that you expect of us. But remind us that we're also citizens of your eternal kingdom. And may we be those who seek to represent you, our king, to represent your truth, your grace, in this world, in this earthly kingdom in which we now live. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen. Before the benediction, let me just thank you for your ongoing generosity as a church family. Uh, you know there are several ways that people can give um, electronically. You can give uh, online. You can give uh, through texting. You can give through your phone app. But however you give, if you choose to give, we just thank you for your generosity. It's honoring to God and allows the church uh, to do great things in our community. So thank you. And if you have a prayer need in your life or you have someone you know or love has a prayer need, you can call our church office or go online and find our prayer partners. We'd love to spend that time with you. Receive now today's benediction that comes from the New Testament book called Jude, 25th verse. So go now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all ages, now and forever.